Norman, thank you for that. Now, Dan um, Sujik is joining us. What I didn't say in the introduction that Dan, in fact, uh, is uh, a, a, I can say a student uh, of Norman's work, having written a book on him and produced, a, in fact, uh, authored and uh, narrated a beautiful film on his work. So, in, in many ways, this conversation also becomes uh, more intimate. Andrew Adonis, as you know, unfortunately, can't be here. Uh, a number of the issues that you raised, Norman, about uh, infrastructure and airports, which I thought would be happily um, moved on to Andrew, uh, I can't do that. So I feel very nervous and want to put on my crash uh, helmet in case we start talking about the Airports Commission and the decision on Heathrow. Some of you know what I mean by that because I wasn't the Airports Commission, but we're not going to uh, go there directly. Uh, but I thought, um, Dan, we, we, we might start just going back a moment. You wrote um, a few years before we started The Urban Age, a book which for many of us actually is incredibly influential, still is today, called The Hundred Mile City. And there you, in a way, chronicled um, some of the problems of the cities as you saw. You traveled to different cities with a great photographer. You described the sort of um, homogeneity that was uh, appearing. And it's going back a number of years, 13, 14 years. I can't help uh, but after hearing Norman sort of uh, talk, so actually, even though you bombard us with statistics and you show us things of enormous beauty, by the way, every single beautiful project was by him, just in case you didn't get it, right? Uh, and, and quite a few of the colleagues in this room. I couldn't but help feel a sense of optimism, actually, the sense that you, you, you could solve some of the problems. Now, then it might be fair that even the urban age, let alone your book, nearly gives a sense of not hopelessness, but you know, here's a problem and is it intractable? And as you sort of think back and, and, and in a way are informed by uh, the analysis of this work and these ideas, what are your reflections on that? Have things changed? Is there greater potential? There's greater knowledge of the problems? Well, Norman is obviously the consumer optimist. Um, you know, I, I thought watching that, um, what Norman was doing was making extremely difficult things seem extremely easy and straightforward. Um, I remember a long time ago thinking about Norman's relationship with Buckminster Fuller, who once proposed the idea of putting a dome over Manhattan, which in his day was a speculation. I think Norman could possibly do it uh, uh, at a pinch. Um, yes, optimism is what one takes from that. Um, it made, I mean, to me, the optimistic things in particular were that image of smog being dealt with in Britain, um, the Green Belt, Britain responding to the big stink, um, and that sense that you can make things happen. But that was also the period, of course, of Brunel, who was perfectly right about making broad gauge railways. It was a far better way of doing things. However, we have a narrow er gauge system because by the time Brunel came along, it was too late. We couldn't go back, and I guess that's some of the arguments that we see about why Heathrow is an investment that will not be walked away from. I saw lots of big ideas, and I think that um, uh, some of the world has an allergy to big ideas. Um, we, we saw those great mayors, but there's also a tradition of technocrats. I think about Robert Moses, who made Manhattan, but also provoked Jane Jacobs to see him as Beelzebub, destroying what makes a city special. Um, Haussmann did much the same for Paris, but perhaps rather more beautifully. Um, so we have, I think, this, this other tendency in, in, in the West in particular of activism, that sense that cities are too complicated to leave to big ideas, that maybe there's another approach which is to solve each problem one pothole at a time. And I suppose you know, we, we have that continuing tension. Um, we like to think of ourselves in London as being a fundamentally conservative city in which nothing very much happens. And of course, look out the window and you see an extraordinary amount has happened in the last 10 or 20 years. I think back to 1984 when the Prince of Wales um, created a collective nervous breakdown in the architectural profession in this country by objecting to one 18-story high building that was never built by Mies van der Rohe. Look out the window now and you see a forest of 1,000-foot high skyscrapers. How has that changed? What's actually allowed what was seen as being insanity, building high-rises over London, to seem normal? It's not based on the electorate in London voting for it. 
I mean, in fact, Ken Livingstone did actually have an agenda when he was elected the first mayor to make London a world financial centre. And in his mind, I think that also involved making it look like a world financial centre, which is the high rises. Um, we do have some of those technocrats. I think that Peter Hendy's contribution to London is extraordinary. I think we now have one of the best mass um, transit. The head systems. of uh, Transport for London for a number of years. We have one of the best mass transits in the world now. Um, it's a fantastic system which is technologically advanced as well. Uh, one of the ways that London has changed, the city apper. Sorry, Norman. It was a big idea. It was a very big idea. So I suppose I'm arguing with myself as usual. <laughs> so I suppose really the kind of, what, what lingers in my mind is how is it that one creates a democratic consensus for these big ideas. But just, if I could pick up, um, there are good guys with good big ideas and there are bad guys with bad big ideas. <laughs> New York wouldn't exist without the big idea of a grid. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there was a very interesting article in the Wall Street Journal that chronicled the history of one block of that grid. Um, when it had no value in the 17th century, and was given to slaves, and it had gone up and down, and one of its biggest rises was in the 60s, when you had the painters who were doing great big paintings, and they could suddenly use that stock. Um, so it had gone up and down. So you need the fix, the framework of the big idea. Big idea Central Park. I mean, the only three-dimensional park in the world, probably the only park that was created for the social good. All the other parks, Royal Hunting Grounds, which eventually were you know, shared by, by, by everybody. Those two big ideas, just pick two. New York wouldn't exist without them. You know, what, would, what would London be without Regent Street? I mean, big ideas. Um, what, and the underground, that's the biggest idea of all. Mm -hmm. And you know, lid, I mean, so, um, so you either go forward or backwards. And it's the mix of the two, the, the small initiatives. So it's not just, uh, and, but it is planning for future generations. It's looking beyond. I think that's very encouraging in terms of some of the things that are happening around us now. I and mean, what is interesting about the points you're both making is you know, where do these ideas ultimately come from? Right? You know, some, some are good, some are bad. And how do you test them? I mean, one of the reflections we've been making uh, recently with, 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 with Philip, my colleague at the Urban Age, is um, you know, we've been observing for 10 years this extraordinary pace. And we, you've talked about it, we've all talked about it, the pace of change. You know, the numbers and the, the amount of things that happens in, in, in the hour that we're speaking here are un, unheard of. I think it's probably fair to say that most of the things, 95% of what is built out there in India, in Asia, etc., is probably spatially fragmented socially disruptive and environmentally negative. In other words, most of that which is built out there is problematic. There was an occasion in Shanghai where the city architect looked out of the window with us and said, you know, probably 25 to 50% of everything that we're building now that I'm commissioning will have to be torn down because it's actually, the, will become socially dysfunctional. So the, the question for me about the ideas uh, to you, to Norman, to you, Dan, also, is, the, is there a problem, ultimately, or how do you deal with this problem of speed? Right? In other words, mm. is there a benefit, maybe, of having a little bit more time, sure. maybe not too much time, you're impatient, I know, uh, uh, in terms of just knowing whether we've got things right? I mean, if Andrew were here, I would say, you've set up a National Infrastructure Commission. You're going to commission, thankfully, things that go beyond political cycles. This is a it, massive political innovation in this country, all good news. How do you know what you're getting right and how do you, in a way, test that? And I was wondering whether you've reflected on that because, you know, you've rightly said you have good and there are good and bad ideas. How do you deal with that issue of time? I think that um, if you, if, if I think of the experience in places like Barcelona or Bilbao, um, there the, there was a very conscious gathering of talent. In other words, you were not just getting people because they were um, influential names in the society. You were getting them because of their skills and um, and the fact that they could make a contribution. 
and they could put the collective interest above their individual interests. So, and, and, and a, a tremendous amount came, I think, from the architectural profession, mm. where you had individuals, I think you've come across it, who uh, would use their skills not in designing, but really, and of course, this is what your city's program mm. is about mm. right here at LSC. Um, so I think it's the quality of the team, the collective, and, 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 and that being chosen for its expertise rather than... But, but my question was, how do you deal with that in a city that's, say, Lagos, Kinshasa, Dakar, or something, which is moving at a pace where perhaps you wouldn't have that maturity of... of, of um, Checking, but bringing in the right but, people. But, but you know, Ricky, when, when um, Engels wrote The Condition of the English Working Class, he was actually in Manchester in a city which he described, which does sound not unlike Kinshasa or Lagos now, in which he looked at multiple degradation, he looked at things happening very quickly, he looked at things being destroyed. I don't think it's the first time in human history that things have actually changed remarkably quickly. Um, I, I suppose there are intellectual and architectural and planning fashions as well. You know, I think if we look at what's happened in, in the West, we've gone from a period in the 1960s when a technocratic approach allowed us to think that big things could work. Um, many of those things actually did work. The British new towns, for example, I think now look like a very solid achievement. The sense that you might actually have technocratic adventures and there was a, there was a loss of nerve. Um, cultures learn from one another. London built the world's first underground railway. Paris didn't do very much for another 40 years and then built a better one. And finally, Crossrail is better than that. Um, Haussmann and Napoleon III saw what Nash did in London and took that to Paris. Things do go up and isn't down. Isn't it the bigger picture? I mean, isn't the, um, the transformative effects of a society that is being mm. emancipated on a huge scale um, where educational standards are going up, access to all the basic necessities, uh, shortcuts will be, will be taken. And it's almost like the opening uh, address right at the beginning. Uh, the city in that sense is a little bit like a manuscript that's added to, um, things will be done in a hurry, they won't be good enough. Um, they'll be knocked down, they'll be replaced, new technologies will, 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 will come mm -hmm. along, improvements. Will, um, I think that there, are, there is a certain inevitability. Perhaps there are things that you can try and slow down. But if you're, if, if you're exposed to that, it's like a juggernaut. It's got an energy and a dynamic of, of, of its own. And what is interesting on, on that note is your last project, the drone project, um, which in many ways is a piece of infrastructure, effectively, that you're, you, you've been thinking about together with Jonathan which frankly, it's very difficult to see what the downsides are. And in that sense, it could actually leapfrog a whole series of otherwise inevitable transformations, investments from the wrong people, terrible roads which will cut off communities, have negative impacts on that. How does one get that story there? Now, a few days ago, you were interviewed um, and, uh, by Rowan Moore, a journalist, critic, writer, uh, in, in The Guardian and The Observer. And the headline was, I don't know if you ever saw the headline, and coming from Northern, there's a sort of quite, quite, quite amusing, says, I have no power as an architect, no power whatsoever. That, that was the headline that came out from, from, from you. Now, I, I think there's an interesting connection there, which is, you know, th there's the leadership issue. You have to have the people who are ready to listen, to assemble, as you said, the right team. Uh, but you nearly denied the role of, the, the creative mind, right? You, and, and therefore, the ability of people in power, and this is, you know, if Andrew were here, it would have been interesting to ask him that, but we can all reflect on that together. You know, where, where does beauty come into this? How, how do you convince someone that actually to spend more money on that beautiful bridge in France is actually worth it? You can't well, say you don't have power, come on. Well, you, you didn't finish the quote, you see. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. So I'll finish the quote for you. Right, okay. Um, I said, I have no power as an architect, absolutely no power whatsoever. Uh, the only power I have is advocacy. Um, 
because I can't, if, if, if I try to convince somebody that they should do something and, and they should do it so it's beautiful and it would not necessarily cost more, but if it does cost more then it would be justified. I can't go into my back pocket and pay for that. I can't pay for the project, so I'm not commissioning it. I'm not a developer. Um, and maybe that would be a more interesting position to be in. Maybe to be like a Nash in the past, who was an uh, architect stroke developer and could put his money where his whatever was. Um, the, uh, I mean, I made the point that I, 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 can't, I can't direct. I can only persuade. So I think that um, if, um, if with my colleagues we have a, a passion and a belief about what we do and how we do it and why we should be doing it, um, then sometimes we're more effective than others in terms of, uh, of, of, of persuasion. So it's the, it's the power of advocacy to be able to try to demonstrate that you should do it that way rather than that way. That um, if you spend a little bit more money doing it this way, you will have a better environment, or you will save some energy, or you will have better internal communications, and that will result in greater productivity. Do, 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 uh, but do, power do, is a very slippery thing. It, you know, a developer is actually usually not an individual. A developer is usually a group of people who manage to assemble a pot of cash <coughs> and a site and deal with a planning system. My experience of developers, well, they're, uh, they're led by individuals who are prepared to take massive risks. Well, with um, other people's money. Yes, well, and so well so they obviously have the power of advocacy. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, but usually the developer will say, and of course there are exceptions. But they're probably putting their own financial lives on the line as well. Uh, so they're taking a gamble. Um, you know, there's a downside to it. Um, one only hears about the success stories, and that's true of any mm. walk of life. Um, but I think but the, the idea of the individual... It's interesting, you're both... Wait, finish that, because I want to... Go on. No, I, I mean, I think you're right. Of course, there are, and there is that, that strength and that leadership. But more often, there are multiple levers, le levers, and usually the individual will say, well, it wasn't me, it was them, I was told to do that, I couldn't do this. And so that, you know, the, the sense, I mean, good things emerge from groups, usually. Although, of course, you have a very strong client down the road. Be be before we begin to open up questions from the floor, I just wanted to take discussion, this discussion connected to what was talked about last night here. Um, Saskia introduced the uh, extraordinary statistics, which she then referred to as practically uh, chronicling a monstrosity of what was happening in the sheer uh, numbers of square meters, square feet, uh, that are owned by foreign investors in different cities. Not that in, that in and of itself was just the problem, but that that was having an impact on the fine grain, effectively, on the porosity, on, on the architecture of the city as, as we know it. And I think one of the things that um, we have all been reflecting on since that moment, since there is this extraordinary need in the world, you know, we've all talked about it, you showed it with your sort of statistics of what's happening in Africa, Latin America, and elsewhere. There, is this, there could not be a moment in history where we need more valuable fundamental infrastructure, fundamental as in the drone project, fundamental as in uh, the hospitals and health centers, and you've been involved in many of those, you didn't have time to talk about it. Why is it, going a bit beyond your, le the developer conversation, that money is not being channeled into exactly this meaningful, necessary infrastructure? What, what is happening out there whereby the investment is, is not happening? Is that a political problem? Is that a risk-averse problem? What, what is that? You know, I never think it's about money. I think it's about attitude of mind. Right. <coughs> it's as simple as that. I mean, um, and, um, and if you take it out of uh, infrastructure and you use the metaphor of making a building, there are some countries where you will pay a price for doing something. They'll do it once, they'll do it well, and that's it. And there are some countries where you'll never get it right, and in between there are some countries where you do it two or three times before you get it right. 
um, which is the cheapest, most economical, high-value route. Mm -hmm. It's doing something, doing it well. That's value for money. It may be a higher or lower first cost. In my experience, it's never about money. It's always about attitude. Some of the best buildings that I know uh, are essentially low-budget buildings. Um, oh, you, St. You, Stephen's you, you Wall Road, um, uh, you know, Wren um, was on a shoestring. There were very, very few things he could do. What he did, he did very, very well. And just, you know, sacrifice himself. The big church in Covent Garden is a great barn of a building, has a super sort of uh, facade. Um, I, I think, I mean, it's not only about money, but I think that um, when investment flows around the world, development becomes a simplified process. It depends on people who are sitting in a bank in Shanghai understanding the proposition of a development in London or in Mexico or in Moscow, and that tends to default to simple basic solutions, and those things simplify cities. Cities are not simple, simple things, they're complex organisms, but if you start to simplify them too much, then they start to lose that sense of essential urbanity. Right, let's, let's use um, uh, the last 10 minutes to have some questions. Um, being the London School of Economics, there's a well-known tradition. Uh, we ask you to say who you are, wait for a microphone, and don't make a speech. Ask a question, uh, and uh, uh, what we will do is take four or five of them, uh, and then ask Norman and Dan to, in a way, respond to those that capture you. So, lady over there on the right-hand side. My name is Susie Hall and I work at the LSE. Um, I'd like to ask um, what kind of political courage and optimism is required to take or reimagine social housing in London seriously? So we'll just go through a few. Gentlemen there, third row, sir, yeah. Say who you are, please. Uh, my name's Merlin Fulcher, and I'm with the Architects Journal. I'd like to ask uh, Norman Foster, uh, would you support Jeremy Corbyn's idea of people's quantitative easing if that could be used to direct infrastructure investment towards projects for social good, and also projects like your own Estuary Airport? Thanks. Right, right in the middle, gentleman there. You take a few more and then mm. uh, Jason Sayer, Architects newspaper. Um, cities such as Oslo have since become car free. Do you see London and other European cities following the same suit? I'm not sure I understood that. Uh, to, to could, I didn't fully understand that. Could you just repeat it? Sorry. Um, Oslo city centre has will be will be car free in 2016, according to their current mayor. Do you see London and other European cities following the same path? So in terms of car free. So way up at the top over there. <coughs> Philippa Barr. Um, I was interested in this comment about um, the idea of planning and doing things by improvisation, maybe multiple times or doing them properly once. Can you comment on how the speed of infrastructure development might have to change with uh, situations of crisis or emergency, such as, for example, the influx of refugees into Europe at the moment? Dan, you want to touch on a couple of those questions? Uh, no, I'll leave it to Norman. Okay. <laughs> I'll leave it to you. No, it's okay. <laughs> Andrew. Uh, um, well, taking the question that was specifically directed at me on quantitative easing, um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not the person to ask about that. I'm not an economist. Um, uh, so I guess it's intuition. Um, and I'm not a historian, but um, I think there's a link between inflation, printing money, and living outside your means, whether that's a nation, a household, or an individual. I just uh, intuitively 
and I, and I don't think there's a connection between um, the need for affordable housing and quantitative easing, which is a euphemism for printing money. Um, uh, I would have thought that, that with such a land stock within the ownership of local authorities, that there could be a mechanism whereby a certain proportion of that would be sold at a rate which had conditions attached to it in terms of uh, the way it would be priced on the market and another proportion that would be made available um, under a different system so that you could use the regulatory powers of those who sell the land to sell them with strings attached so you could address the issue at every level in, uh, in society. I mean, certainly we do have a housing emergency. It's a similar problem in, in other majorly successful cities. If you talk to people in San Francisco or Los Angeles, they have some of the same issues that we have in London, which is unaffordability, people buying housing as asset classes, and that might have something to do with quantity easing as well. When you have zero interest rates, then of course, um, housing as an asset starts to bubble. Um, but there is something really disheartening about London and the UK in general, which in the 1960s could build 400,000 houses a year for a smaller population, about 50 million then. We now have 10 million more people, and we sim simply can't manage that. And it's partly about the market. Um, you know, market housing does not really prosper on building large numbers of housing units quickly. It depresses prices. Until now, governments have actually also discouraged the local authorities to build more, and I would certainly think that that needs to be altered. Um, I, I think there is a, you know, if, if we can manage Transport for London to do one of the best mass transit systems in the world, there's no reason why Britain can't use some of those techniques and skills to address its housing crisis. Just on that note, do, do, do you see London becoming more car-free over the next generation, years? Absolutely. I mean, you see a generation for whom car ownership has not become a necessary thing in a big city, yes. And we're now at that tipping point where, I mean, the conflict between cycling and motoring is now at a critical point, but I think that um, as cycling becomes safer, um, it starts to take more cars off the road, and I think we're at a tipping point there as well in the way that London functions that way. Maybe also the car may morph into something else. It may change mm -hmm. its nature. The ability to um, perhaps with robotic potential for cars to be nose to tail like a convoy to reduce accidents, the drive becomes leisure time, the car is on autopilot, um, it's following the same pattern which is, has evolved uh, in, the, um, in the airways, in the aerial highways, um, and, um, and that could give greater saturation of a road system, it could change the perception of suburbia, um, it could avoid more road building problem mm -hmm. pr programs, um, and, um, and the aircraft themselves could also change. The largest regional carrier in America, which is Cape Air, um, in terms of its orders for new aircraft, has gone totally electric. I'd like to try and capture and maybe conclude with some thoughts on the two, let's call it social questions that uh, were framed a moment ago. When uh, Norman, you and I talked about uh, inviting you to um, <coughs> speak at the celebration of the event, I said, well, what might we talk about? And I said, you know, design, infrastructure. And I think w you became very interested in the notion of the social meaning of infrastructure. And you know, you, you talked about that. And in hearing what you said and also what Dan was talking about in terms of the reactions to some major events in the 19th century, in the mid 20th century, or as has been referred to now, you know, a very real problem. Uh, do, do some ideas actually come out of these shocks? Do, 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 you, need, do you need something to completely uh, throw things around, to change the paradigm, to re-question what you're doing, also to consider what the value of architectural infrastructure um, is, and I think it would be interesting to, to uh, just reflect on that, Dan. 
sometimes you do think that there are very few basic ideas about the city. It's high density or low density. It's laissez-faire or it's control. There's always this duality between the two. Um, there are, ch I, th I think speed has, 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 has impacted. I will also keep going back to one of the ideas that Saskia Sasson had in one of the earlier sessions of the urban age where she came up with this idea of cityness. And maybe these urban agglomerations that we see everywhere have greater or lesser degrees of this cityness quality. So the edge of Brazzaville is a place in which rural Africans have migrated and live on market gardening. So it's urbanism that's actually bypassed industrialization. Does that have a quality of cityness or not? I, I'm not sure. Whereas in, in the Western world, perhaps we start to leach out this quality of cityness as cities become oversimplified or the grain loses, maybe we, we lose that. And maybe the most essential quality that we need to really nourish and nurture is cityness, whatever that means. So what is the infrastructure of, of cityness, Norman? I think it's all the, um, in a way, I, I, I suspect if you wind back decade by decade and you had a gathering like this, it, there will be a certain rhythm mm. to it. You would hear the same Sorry. elements being protested and uh, the city would be responding by changing, by morphing. Some areas would be going up, some would be going down. <coughs> I remember with Elena we traveled to China to meet with artists who, some of whom are household names, um, Ai Weiwei in the Royal Academy, totally unknown then, uh, saw the areas that they had led uh, and transformed, rather like Soho, um, and then saw that those areas became popular, gentrified, 9-11 in, um, in, um, in Beijing, uh, and they move on, colonize, it's not affordable, everybody's protesting, they move on, they find another place. And it, it's that kind of those, those waves, the chance things. I mean, the, the ideal city, I mean, and London, I don't think has ever been better than it is at the moment, all the problems notwithstanding. I mean, it has an extraordinary <coughs> vibrancy. For different reasons, other cities, uh, well, Madrid is an extraordinary city, Berlin is an extraordinary city. They all have their own qualities and identities. And thank God for that. There is a there there. There are differences. Well, it's clear that just by referring to the, these uh, cities and their different characteristics that, you know, there's m much more for all of us to do. Uh, just in response to the question about the refugees uh, issue, we've spent the last five hours with many of the colleagues sitting here in the front rows of uh, the urban age really saying we don't have an answer to that question. What are cities in Europe and elsewhere doing, even though, as the mayor of Washington City reminded us, it's the city that's the front line. You know, it's, uh, national policies can fail, international policies can fail, but it's the city that has to take, take it all in a, in a way. So I think that is an issue that generations of urban age and uh, students who are here and fellow city makers will need to take into account. But in the end, it's the environmental and the social meaning of infrastructure that needs to be understood. And I think tonight, Norman, you've given us great insights on that. Dan, Norman, thank you very much. Thank you.